and we're going to start chapter 6, but chapter 6 is just more forces, okay? Chapter 6 is just more forces. Okay, so that's recording, and you guys see the document camera over there in Enid? You guys see the document camera? What do you see on the screen? Well, I know you guys see paper on the screen. I'm trying to make sure they see oh, paper on the screen. Sorry, my new, my mic was muted. Yeah. Oh, now, we're seeing the dog cam. Now we're seeing we the, see dog the dog cam. cam. Yeah, so we're good now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with a problem to warm us up. In this problem, we've got a, let's say, a, a cargo van. And we all know my artistic abilities are limited. Strong cargo van. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's strong cargo van. And on this cargo van, somebody's experimenting, and they are going down the hill on the cargo van, and I've got a toy that's hung from the ceiling of the cargo van. And it's hung there, and this angle and this angle are the same. Okay, so those angles are the same. The initial velocity was equal to 30 meters per second. The final velocity is 30 meters per second. The time that it took to do this is six seconds. And the mass of the bob on the pendulum is equal to 1.00 kilograms. We wanna know the angle and the tension in the string. Okay? That's what we want to know. We want to determine all the tension in the string. So, first part of this problem is that we're, we're going to be looking at a force. Particularly when I'm looking for tension, I'm looking at a force. So we're going to need the acceleration. Now we've got lots of information that gives us the accelerator, that allows us to calculate the acceleration. Velocity final is equal to velocity initial plus acceleration times time. My initial velocity is zero, makes life easy. So I get my final divided by the time, gives me my acceleration. So I get 30 meters per second divided by six seconds. That's going to give me 5 meters per second squared. Now, I'm going to expand a little bit on this picture right here so that we can figure out what forces that we have coming into play. So, here's my pendulum with my little mass on it. This is the angle. We know we have tension being applied. We have the weight of the mass at the bottom and we have an acceleration that's going downhill. So that's basically what we have. Now if I look at this on the incline and I think we've talked about it before, I can rewrite my force, break it into its components where this is the force perpendicular to the plane, and this is the force parallel to the plane. So if it's perpendicular, that's going to be my force cosine of the angle, and in this case it's going to be mg cosine of the angle. Force parallel is the force sine of the angle, and that's going to be mg sine of the angle. So to help us work this problem, I'm going to not use our standard X and Y coordinate system. This is one of those cases where it's easier to change my coordinate system than it is to try and work in that Cartesian coordinate system. So basically what I'm going to work in is a coordinate system that looks like this. I have an axis parallel to the incline and I have an axis perpendicular to the incline. And I can do the sum of my forces. And in this case, 
we're looking at a static situation inside of the truck, right? We're looking at the static situation inside the truck. So it's kind of that frame of reference, like being inside the elevator. And so when I'm in a static situation, the sum of the forces have to equal zero relative to the truck. So if I'm doing the sum of the forces perpendicular or normal to the plane, this is going to be the tension minus mg cosine of my angle. mg is the mass times gravity. It's the weight of my object. I can do this, the force parallel, and that's going to be the mass times the acceleration going down the hill. And in this case, I'm saying down the hill is positive to help, to help out my situation. But there is the bob in the other direction. So now I've got Two equations, two unknowns, once again. I don't know tension, and I don't know the angle. So the easiest way to do this one is another little math trick, right? I can do a couple of different things. I can do this this way. I can solve that M is equal to G or M. M's cancel out, so I get A is equal to G sine of the angle, okay? And we calculated the acceleration, so I can calculate, so I can take A divided by G is equal to the sine of the angle, the arc sine of the angle, it's going to be A divided by G is going to give me my angle, and I'm going to get sine minus 1, 5 meters per second squared divided by 9.8 meters per second squared gives me 30.7 degrees. Now T is going to equal mg cosine of the angle. That's my 0.1 kilograms, 9.8 meters per second squared, cosine of 30.7 degrees gives me 0 0.843 newtons. So drawing your picture and looking at what information you know is really, really going to help you out. Totally going to help you out. You guys good over there? Thumbs up if you're good over there and need. Yay, good. Alright. So, so far, we've dealt with forces. We've dealt with our first condi condition of equilibrium. But we started talking about it on, feels like Monday again. <laughs> we started talking about it on Monday. But um, if I take a hockey puck and it's moving along, hockey pucks are nearly frictionless. Okay, They're nearly frictionless, so we don't have to worry about it too much. But if I do the same thing and I have a block of wood on concrete, we know something happens. If I tap this block of wood on concrete, it's going to move, but it's not going to move very far. And we had talked about that resistive force, and we kind of defined it just a little bit, and we had just written down that friction was a coefficient times the normal force. Okay? And we had just started talking about it, in fact, I, I'm not even sure. I think I did the calculator thing on cardboard and had it start to slip, right? Showed, did this kind of thing, in my car, did this part and did it and it started to slip and we could actually look at it from a calculator point of view. 
Now some interesting things happen, okay? So I can have my pin on here and my pin is gonna stay and my pin is gonna stay and then it's gonna slide. All right, and we talked about how one was static friction and one was kinetic friction once I got it to move. Well, here's something else. I'm gonna take my pin here and we're actually gonna see that I can also, so I've got my pin and so there's the kinetic friction associated with sliding, but this is one of the reasons why I switched to this book because we don't even talk about this in the other book, is that when I actually lift it up, my pin is gonna roll. And the coefficient associated with rolling is even different than the coefficient associated with just sliding. And so we get different coefficients of friction depending upon the motion that we're doing. Um, last year had uh, one of the Bartlesville, or not Bartlesville, one of the Ponca City Police Detectives come, or come in that does ask us in investigations. And they talk about a skid sled that they use that's an actual tire, part of a tire filled with concrete, and they drag it across the to drag it across the, the intersection to figure out what the um, coefficient of friction was associated with the tires. And one of the interesting things is if you slam on your brakes, that coefficient of friction is going to be different than if I'm still rolling along, because if I'm rolling, I've got a different coefficient of friction, and that's going to help us determine you know, speeds or whatever's happening with the result of the accident. So we, we see a lot of those, and I talked about how you can actually calculate these coefficients of friction. So let's take um, uh, indentured servitude is alive and well. It's called graduate school. <laughs> it really is. It is. Indentured servitude is alive and well. It's called graduate school. And there's some poor soul out there that's measuring coefficients of friction. Okay? And it's actually a fairly simple way to do it. So I have a plane, an incline plane, and there's an angle here. And if I've got an object on my incline plane, just like my demonstration with my calculator, the calculator is going to sit there until all of a sudden the force is overcomes friction that's going to allow it to slide down the plane. There's my force due to friction. And so we're going to say that we've done this. We have some object here, and we've lifted it up, and all of a sudden it starts to slide at 27.6 degrees. So when I get my, ang my angle up to 27.6 degrees, I'm going to get this thing to start to slide. So let's look at the forces that we have, and then we're going to look at the forces parallel to the inclined plane. So I'm going to look at that force parallel to the inclined plane. And just as it starts to slip, this is when we start having and doing deal with strange things when we start looking at questions in physics. When it just starts to slip, it's just over zero because as long as it's not slipping, I have no acceleration. Okay? But as soon as it starts to slip, this is no longer going to be zero, but this is going to tell me the instant it slips, it's going to be the, I'm still kind of there. And I know that once I go a little further, I'm going down the plane. But when they say at the instant it starts to slip, I've got the force due to friction that has to be overcome by the force of the object going down parallel to the plane. And just like we saw here momentarily, or was just a bit ago, if I have my incline, here's my force due to gravity. We've got this angle. There's my parallel. Here's my perpendicular. And this angle is equal to this angle. So this side for perpendicular, it's going to be my force due to gravity cosine of the angle, which would be mg cosine of the angle, but that's also equal to my normal force.
That's also equal to my normal force. Now this side is force due to gravity, sine of the angle, which is also mg sine of the angle. So now if I go and plug this back in, now one of the things I want you guys to notice is if I go to the back of the chapter, right? If I go to the back of the chapter, I'm going to see the following. I'm going to see F is equal to MA, right? We've, and up to this point, we've seen V final is equal to V initial plus AT. And we've seen V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2A times my change in position. And I have my change in position is equal to V naught plus 1 half AT squared. And I have some variations on those, right? If I've done them in the y direction and they've done the calculation for range or something like that. But basically, so far, those are all the equations that we have. You're not going to see an equation in the back of the chapter that looks like this. You've actually had to derive the equation that you're going to use to solve the problem. So this is one of those first times that I can't give you the equation. You're not going to be given the equation for every situation. You may have to derive that equation for the situation. So this is one of our first cases when we start dealing with the sum of the forces, just like we dealt with the Atwood's problem. Remember the Atwood's problem was my pulley system with a block on one side and a block on the other side. There's no standard equation that's going to tell me how to solve that problem. I have to figure out the equation I'm going to use. In this case, we're using a condition of equilibrium to help us solve the problem. So, if I do that, well, I know what my force due to friction is. My force due to friction is my coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So now if I've got zero is equal to my force due to friction minus the force parallel, my force due to friction is going to equal the force parallel. This side becomes, I look at mg mu cosine of the angle because mg cosine of the angle is my normal force. My mu is the coefficient that I'm trying to find. And this side is mg sine of the angle. Well, life is good. Masses cancel. Gravity cancels. And mu now becomes sine of the angle divided by the cosine of the angle. But hopefully we all remember that that's tangent of the angle. And now that's tangent of 27.6 degrees, and when I plug that into the calculator, I get that it's 0.523, and it's unitless, okay? It's coefficient, it's unitless. And this is static friction. Okay, that's static friction. So I can me me measure those. And that's what you guys are actually going to do in the lab. You're going to do a couple of things to measure coefficients of friction. This is one method. The lab's going to use a different method. So that's one, and it's going to have you compare. So let's look at a couple of problems that helps us play with this. So now we can measure coefficients of friction. So we can do that empirically, and then we can play with it. So, I've got a tabletop, and on this tabletop, I've got a little pulley, and I've got a mass that's hanging from the pulley, and on over here I also have a mass that's sitting on the tabletop. Now this mass is 0.5 K 
kilograms. And this mass is 0 0.55 kilograms. Now, we want to know what happens when I, if I have my finger on this mass, we want to know, is it going to slide off the table? And if it does, what's the acceleration? So the first thing I need to know, because we also know from experience that we've set up these systems before and nothing happens. We've set up these systems and then something happens. So we're going to assume right now that this is a glass tabletop. And we're going to assume that this is a wooden block. So what I'm going to need to know is the coefficient of static friction between wood on glass. Now, if I am doing this in WebAssign, it may give me the static, it may give me the coefficient of friction. If I'm looking at my book, this happens to be table 6.1, will give me some coefficients of static friction. But it turns out that I don't have wood on glass in our table 6.1, so I had to go look it up. Um, the engineering toolbox has a whole bunch of coefficients of friction. Um, standard CRC handbook has a whole bunch of coefficients of friction. And I happened to do a little quick search and I found that in general, depending on the type of wood, because there are other types of, there's lots of types of wood, it ranges from 0 0.25 to 0.5 for static friction. And for kinetic friction, it ranges, it's about 0.2. So I'm going to actually use 0.3 as a good as a good value for static friction. And the first thing I want to know is, first, will it move? And if you want to get lost on YouTube, I don't know if you've seen the blender one, will it blend? And he's got like a gazillion things that he puts in there. Lots of them that you go, hmm, just about everything blends in that blender. <laughs> but we want to know whether or not it'll move. So the first thing I want to do in these situations is I want to draw my free body diagram. So I have the force due to gravity. I have the normal force. I've got a force due to friction, potentially, and I have tension in the rope. On this mass, I have the force due to gravity. I have tension in the rope. And if I look at this, the sum of the forces in the x direction, if it's going to be greater than zero, what's going to happen is that the tension has got to be bigger than the force due to friction. All right? If it's going to be greater than zero, my tension has got to be bigger than my force due to friction. Anything less, and the block's going to sit there. And this is static. Okay, that's static. Anything less and the block's going to sit there. Over here, <coughs> because I'm in that situation, right, I've got mass times acceleration and I've got tension, but at the point where this is going to break free to find out if it's going to move, the tension is equal to mg. Well, that's good, so I can solve for that. If that's 0.55, so that's 0.55 kilograms, gravity is 9.8, that tells me that the tension in the rope is going to be 5.39 newtons. Well, my force due to static friction is going to be mu times my static friction times the normal force, which is going to be 0.3 my normal force is 0.5 kilograms times 9.81. And if I plug that in, I find out that that number works out to be like um, 1.47 newtons. Tension in the rope is bigger than that, so it's going to start to move. And then we 
I can figure out where it's going to start, you know, what it's going to be starting at. Because now, if I say, all right, it's now moving, okay? So my sum of the forces in the x direction is going to be mass times the acceleration in the x direction, which is equal to tension minus my force due to kinetic friction, since it's now moving. Mass times acceleration is going to equal my tension that I figured out was 5.39 newtons minus coefficient of static friction times mg. So now I've got um, 5.39. We said that that was 0.2. My mass was 0.5, And when I do that, this gives me 4.41 newtons, mass times acceleration in the x, acceleration in the x, 4.41 newtons divided by the mass, which is 4.41, and this is kilograms, meters per second squared, divided by 0.5 kilograms. Kilograms cancel, I actually have an acceleration, and when I plug that in the calculator, I get 8.82 .8 meters per second squared. So we can account for the thing that's moving. So we're going to look at problem very similar to this, a little more complicated. This time, I've got a setup that looks like this. This is steel. This is an aluminum block. This is a copper block. We've got 2.0 kilograms of aluminum. We have 6.0 kilograms of copper. We can look up the coefficients of kinetic friction. So the coefficients of kinetic friction for aluminum is 0 0.47. Static friction is 0 0.61. Kinetic friction for copper is 0 0.36, static is 0 0.53, and that's for copper on steel and that's for aluminum on steel. So if I look at my aluminum block, I've got a normal force, I've got mass I've got tension in the string and I've got a resistive force due to friction. Friction for aluminum is going to equal, if I'm doing kinetic, it's going to be 0 0.47 and we had 2 kilograms and we had 9.8 for gravity and that gives me 9.2 newtons. If I do the copper, I got to do those lovely sign things again. So my force due to friction for copper is going to be new kinetic, normal force, and that's going to be 0 0.36, 6 kilograms. 9.8, and I didn't give you the angle. The angle is 30 degrees. And that's cosine of 30 degrees. This gives me 18 newtons. So if this system moves, I'm going to have the sum of the forces on the aluminum block are going to equal mass times acceleration tension minus the force due to friction. If I do it for the copper block, I still get mass times acceleration. And this is going to be 
mg sine of the angle because that's the force that's causing it to go down the, the parallel side minus the tension minus the force due to friction and now I can plug in some numbers here this, if I could do that, this becomes 6 times the acceleration equals 29.4 minus tension minus 18. And I get, um, I get 11.4 minus tension, that's this side over here, is equal to 6A. Oh, I've got two equations, two unknowns, because this one works out to be, I have this mass, which is two times the acceleration, is equal to tension minus 9.2. Two equations, two unknowns, and I can solve for acceleration, or I can solve for tension. And so let's go ahead and do that real quick. So I have 2A is equal to tension minus 9.2. I have 6A is equal to minus tension plus 11.4. I get 8 times acceleration is equal to 2.2. Did I do that right? Acceleration is equal to 2.2 divided by 8. And that should give me something like 2.75 meters per second squared. this problem and hopefully by Monday I will have posted um, I've done this problem several times so I have video of this problem in addition to how I'm going to do it today and because I have video of it several times sometimes I describe it a little differently so hopefully it will help you make it make sense I have a sled and on this sled I have a penguin so there's my penguin on the sled we want to know what force we can apply, what's the maximum force we can apply to make sure before the penguin slides off the slit. Okay. This is AKA similar to sitting on the back of the pickup truck when somebody is on the tailgate of the pickup truck, somebody accelerates and all of a sudden you go plop because the pickup truck is accelerated from underneath you. This is the same kind of problem. All right. If the pickup truck goes off slowly, no problem. Pickup truck goes fast, shoot, you're down. So we've seen this m multiple times. So the sled has a weight of 60 newtons. It's already a force. So when you guys are working these problems, double check because they may give you a force already. Pounds are a force, newtons are a force. The coefficient of friction, 0.1, is between the sled and the snow, with just the sled. The penguin has a force of 70 newtons, and the coefficient of friction, and this is static friction, is 0.7 between the penguin and the sled. We want to find the maximum force that can be exerted before the penguin slides off. So if I look at this, I've got the force of the penguin, I've got the force being applied, I've got a normal force on the penguin. If 
I look at the sled, I have the weight of the penguin plus the weight of the sled. I've got the force being applied, and this is going to be 70 newtons plus 60 newtons is equal to 130 newtons. And then I have a normal force of the penguin plus the sled. When the penguin starts to slip, the force is going to equal the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, which is going to equal the force being applied. This is the force that we're trying to look at, which is going to equal the mass of the penguin times the acceleration of the penguin. So the acceleration of the penguin, when it starts to slip, is the coefficient of static friction, the normal force, divided by the mass of the penguin. This ends up being the coefficient of static friction, the mass of the penguin, times gravity, divided by the mass of the penguin. So we end up with coefficient of static friction times gravity. And if I want to put numbers into it, I get 0.7 times 9.8, which is equal to 6.86 meters per second squared. So what this means is, so if the force exceeds an acceleration of 6.86 meters per second squared, the penguin is going to slip off the sled. And we're going to have to collect him. And he'll probably be a very mad penguin. Well, I don't know what you guys, but I don't think I want a mad penguin after me. Okay. So now we're going to look at the whole system. So the summation of forces on the whole system is going to be the force applied minus the force due to friction times the mass of the system, times the acceleration of the system. And this is the friction of the sled in the snow. Okay, So the force that can be applied is going to equal the mass of the system, the acceleration of the system, plus coefficient of friction times the normal force of the system. So the mass of the system, we said, was 130 newtons. Or, or this is 130 newtons, and because it was a mass, I have to divide by gravity. I need to divide by gravity. My acceleration is my 6.86 meters per second squared. This time, I have to put the coefficient between the sled and the snow. And the normal force is 130 newtons, because that's the whole system. So this becomes 130 divided by 9.8 times 6.86 meters per second squared plus 0.1 times 130. This ends up being 91 newtons plus 13 newtons is equal to 104 newtons. And if I pull the sled with a force greater than 104 newtons, this, the penguin's going to go tumbling off. So now you started to deal with friction. Most of chapter eight, at least the start of the, or chapter six, um, starts with doing these friction type problems. We're also gonna start looking at drag and looking at centripetal. Yeah. That one? So you guys can start your chapter six homework. Got a quiz on Friday. Class won't meet on Friday which is good because I think people are going to be disappearing for a variety of reasons. <laughs> and we go from there. I will be over in Enid, guys, um, Friday morning. I'll probably leave at about 11.45 if you guys need, it, need to 
catch me for something. Do you remember?